I'm Jeremy Hunter. Welcome to Untaught Essentials. Here we explore the topics that are important for life and leading that we were never taught in school. This episode explores the power of humor and play. Let's face it, we live in a time that's very serious. Coronavirus, economic strife, social inequity, political instability, technological revolution, oh, and climate change. There's a lot to be serious about. But what role can or should humor and play serve in all this? Joining me in this conversation is Jacqueline Fletcher Johnson, writer, teacher, and as we'll learn, cancer survivor. She harnessed the power of humor and play while facing a cancer diagnosis in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. I think you'll see that far from being a light topic, it is incredibly powerful and profound. So hello, welcome to Untaught Essentials. I would like to welcome my guest, Jacqueline Fletcher Johnson, who does many things. She is a speaker, trainer, and writer. She works primarily with doctors and nurses in a medical setting. Uh, her, her specialty is working with the stressed out and burned out among us, and, and especially those on the front lines of fighting coronavirus. Uh, she is the author of 14 books on her way to the 15th. She is the host of her own TV show at Mayo Clinic, and she is the creator of Holy Crap, I Got Cancer During Coronavirus podcast. And today, I, th I thought it would be a fantastic opportunity to talk with Jackie about the power of humor. And you know, given that we live in a very serious age, right? Not only do we have the pandemic, but we have economic crises, we have social inequality, we've got climate change and, and all of that that that's bringing, you know, there's a lot of serious things going on. And to talk about humor, I think is a, is a way to uh, add some balance to how do we approach life. But, but in any case, so that's my motivation. Jackie, say a little bit about yourself. And you have more hair on your head uh, than the first time we met. <laughs> and uh, tell us about what's been going on in, in your life. Well, I am glad I have a lot more hair on my head than when we first met. Uh, so I'll say that first. Uh, so I am, you know, somebody who helps people who are, are, are basically on the floor and, and working to get back up, mm. uh, who are looking or going through a hard time, they're stressed out, they're burned out. And I've been doing that work for a long time. Mm. Um, I've worked with patients at the bedside at Mayo Clinic and have worked with physicians, as you mentioned, and all sorts of different folks around this topic for years. And then in 2019, uh, at the end in December, uh, found out actually on December 13th, Friday the 13th, of course, wow. that um, that I was uh, diagnosed with breast cancer. Wow. And so uh, that started this experience that I ended up going through cancer treatments during the, the coronavirus. So as it was emerging around the world and spreading around the world. And so um, I found myself going through something really hard and having to employ all of the skills that I had been teaching uh, all, the, all those years, and of course had used myself. Uh, and I discovered as I was going through that process that I had really missed something fundamental. Mm. And what I had missed was lightness and laughter and love and pleasure and just uh, how, ex how powerful those really, really are uh, to our mental health, our emotional health, our spiritual health, our physical health. And so, you know, that was one of the biggest discoveries I made in this past year was just how powerful those are as resilience tools uh, and to, um, so that you can get through something hard and make a comeback, so. You know, I think right now we have a very kind of challenged relationship to the whole idea of humor and that it, it can be seen as making light of somebody or something or trivializing or demeaning. And I, and I think that's not really the role that humor 
in its deepest form plays. And I, I might, I wonder what you might say to that. Yeah, I mean, I think that humor is one of those things that it's actually a, a really essential kind of way to raise our life force uh, in a way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had been living this life of uh, just being busy all the time and running my own business and raising kids and working and on all of those things that kind of the American culture that ke it keeps us so busy all the time and really feeling that kind of chronic stress. And so when I, when I was diagnosed with cancer, um, it was almost like I had to step out of this life that I was living and really look at a different way of being for a while and where humor came in for me because there were many things that were not funny that were going on, of course, in my experience with cancer and also the world around us. And, um, and so the, the role that humor played for me was really about, it was connected to joy and it was connected to fun and it was connected to uh, pleasure and laughter and lightness and lightheartedness. Um, I had always been the serious one. Um, my daughter had accused me of that actually. There, she was like four years old and she, uh, she came up to me and she's like, mommy, you never laugh at my jokes. Daddy always laughs at my jokes. You're the serious one. <laughs> and I remember being so just horrified by that, that my daughter thought I was the serious one. I, I never used to be that way when I was young. And, um, and so I felt like I had really lost that connection to play and joy and humor is a part of that. And like you said, it's not making fun of people it's really finding things humorous and finding things funny. I didn't even know what I thought was funny. Mm -hmm. So um, there was this, an experience that I had when um, I started, you know, I was going through treatment. It was a tough uh, five months of treatment. And uh, so first I started to just wonder like, you know, um, I had already kind of been thinking about this idea of humor and wondered, what do I even think is funny? What do I, what do I enjoy? Um, what do I find pleasurable? And I really had a hard time answering those, those questions. And so um, there was a night where I was slated to go into the hospital the next day to get um, immunotherapy and chemotherapy all at once. I was in a trial and uh, I was really scared. And so I was up in the middle of the night and I went um, downstairs and ended up making a video for my family and friends that I posted on my Facebook page. And I just said, you guys, I'm freaking out. I'm super scared. This is happening tomorrow. And when I was a kid, I used to tell myself stories when I was afraid to make myself feel better. And so I asked if they would tell me a story in the comments on the Facebook page. And so then the next morning, I was sitting in the hospital and this gray plastic chair, uh, you know, a cancer ward is, um, you know, infusion center is, is not a very joyful place. And uh, so I was sitting in this chair and instead of focusing on what was going on around me, I ended up reading this story that my friends and family were uh, making for me on my Facebook page. And it was so sweet and it was so loving. And it was about this, you know, brave woman, of course, but it was hilarious. It was so funny. And just these random things would happen, you know? And so like this woman goes off on a quest and there's a talking canoe. I don't know. There's a talking canoe, why not? And so all these things were going on and I was reading this and just started laughing as I was sitting in that chair. And so the time passed very quickly. And so that night when I got home, I knew that because I was in this trial, I really had to track all of my symptoms. And I knew that I was going to get a fever of 104 degrees. I knew that I was going to have all over body pain. I knew that I was going to, uh, you know, get those teeth chatters like so hard that you just cannot control. And I knew that my body, like I would just start to cry, not because I was feeling sad, but because I don't know, I was releasing toxins or something. And so I would just cry and cry and cry. And 
um, it was a really disturbing experience to go through. And so uh, that night I, I woke up as the symptoms started coming in, I could feel it coming. And, um, but when I woke up this time, I started thinking about this story again, and I started just laughing in the middle of the night. And that's when I had this idea. I, I just had this thought come to me that was like, you know what, I, I think I need to start the holy crap I got cancer during the coronavirus comedy show. Wouldn't that be hilarious? <laughs> so then I just started laughing some more because I was like, this is ridiculous. This is such a ridiculous idea. And so I started thinking about all these skits that I would do. And then I started laughing even more. And so then I had to get up out of bed and just start brainstorming and thinking about all these skits that I would do. And so I noticed that, you know, that night my fever only got to 102 my body pain was better. And so I just, I didn't just go down as, 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 as deeply as I would normally did. So the next day I called one of my brothers and I told him this idea. And at the beginning of the call, I had a fever of 102 and body pain. And then we laughed for 45 minutes. And then at the end of the call, I had no fever and no pain for, it was like about two hours. And then it would come back and because I'm kind of a research geek, I decided to experiment again. And so I did it again the next day and called another friend and the same exact thing happened. And so I thought, you know, there's, there's really something to this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start the holy crap, I got cancer during the coronavirus comedy show to just save my own butt and to make myself laugh. Uh, and that is the only reason I started it. That's, I had, that's the only thing I had in mind when I was creating the pieces and it's still the only reason I did it. Um, and so uh, what I'm happy to know is that it's helping other people, but it really taught me, um, it gave me this real push to start looking at what is funny, what is humorous. And then when there are days when I don't feel like anything's funny, then, then what, then what do you do there? And so that journey took me to watching hilarious videos on YouTube, seeing what other people thought were, you know, was funny. I started watching like the top comedy videos, just like uh, movies to see if any of those movies I thought was funny. Like I started to kind of explore what, what I thought was funny. Um, and then the second part of that is um, after George Floyd was murdered and the coronavirus death counts were going up and you know there was so much so much happening in our country that was not funny um and then i also started getting to the really intense parts of the treatment and i took a couple you know i took about a month and i said i don't i don't think i can make any videos right now because i don't think anything is funny so what can i do and so i started asking myself these two questions every day and one was, what do you think is fun or funny or pleasurable? And the other thing that I would ask myself is, if I didn't think anything was fun or funny or pleasurable, is what, would, what do you find nourishing and what would nourish you today? And that practice of asking myself those two questions every day changed my life. Hmm. So that's a very long-winded answer to your question about humor. <laughs> but that's where I've come to because of this experience. And where do you, well, I mean, there's so much in that, right? One is that just the idea that you had the power to do something different, right? And, and I think when we're, you know, I certainly have my own experience of facing medical diagnoses that at the outset seem very daunting. And then realizing, and I, I don't want to say you have a choice, but that you can create options in that, right? Absolutely. And and that you chose an option that was really energy creating at some level. That, you know, that, that's one thing. And it, it makes me think about the episode we did on love in December of 2020 with Peggy and Larry Ward. And, and Peggy talked about love being in energy. Mm. And, and it seems to me humor is, is closely related to that in, somehow, in some way of, of uh, you know, just shifting, shifting energy, you know, that the hallmark of humor is, is um, the ability to tell a different story about what's going on in some way, right? 
Absolutely. It is all about energy, I think, and shifting that energy, reframing that energy. Um, you know, and I think you and I have talked about this, right? Because we both come out of the mindfulness world and the well-being world, which sometimes takes itself really, really seriously. <laughs> and <laughs> I have been very guilty of that. Uh, but what I found, you know, and, and of course, I, I, I did a little deep dive into some of the research around all of this and what does happen in the body. How does it shift the energy? You know, we know that laughter, I mean, it creates all that beautiful, the release of oxytocin and all of those chemicals that make you feel love. Like it makes you actually, when you laugh together, you know, it makes you feel like you've been friends forever. If you laugh with someone and you feel that warmth in your body, like, oh my gosh, I love this person. And so I think it's very closely related to love. And, you know, one other thing that what you said reminds me of is that during that time, you know, I read Norman Cousins' famous book. You've read his famous book, The Anatomy of a Patient, mm -hmm. which is really about his journey with um, an illness that was supposedly a chronic and, you know, fatal illness and his journey through that. And it was interesting because he's really known for, he laughed his way through it. And what he had done was, um, you know, he he knew the guy that that did Candid Camera, the TV show Candid Camera, and so that guy got him a projector and got him, you know, episodes of the show so that he would go in and just watch these uh, episodes and laugh. And he really attributed his positive emotions to that experience. What I took away from that book and some of his comments that that he's made since, you know, that he made after he had written that book, he said, you know, people took it out of context. And he said, what I was really trying to get at was this idea that that the patient is in control, that that you have a choice. And that was the part of it that really resonated with me that, you know, I could have just stayed in that place of being so fearful and you know, and I did have those moments because I don't think, you know, using humor is not about denying feelings in any way, shape or form. I think that's devastating as well. So I think, you know, the, the permission giving to say, I'm going to feel my feelings and I'm also going to take control over this situation and reframe it in a way that's energetically you know, vibrant and mm. brings me to life so that even that, uh, even though I'm going through something hard, I'm going to feel alive. And so that for me was what I took away from his work. Um, because I just felt like that's, that is the work that we're here to do is how do we feel most alive? Right. I mean, no matter what we're facing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It makes me think about the uh, Joseph Campbell quote. It's like, we're not here to find, seek the meaning of life. We are really seeking the experience of being truly alive, right? Yes. And what, yes. what are some of the things you did to connect to that? Well, so the very first thing I did is I returned to something I had left behind a long time ago. And that was singing. And so I, the very first thing I made for the, the comedy show was the introduction to it, which uh, <laughs> this is, um, I don't know what happened, but I just ended up, I wrote a song. I've never written a song before in my life, but I was like, I'm going to write a song. And so I wrote a song and then I sang it and recorded it. And then I recorded myself kind of dancing around to the song. And I you know, so it was a it was a creative project. So that's the other part that really lit me up as I really plugged into my creativity. And so I ended up making this video that was just the introduction for the show, which I just thought was so hilarious. And every time I watch it still, I end up laughing. And then I did um, this is just this was my this my one of my favorites. Um, but I and so singing was one and then creating characters. And so another thing that I did was um, that I went on Snapchat <laughs> and they have this baby filter. And it because I had no hair and no eyebrows and no eyelashes, I looked 100 percent like a baby. <laughs> and so <laughs> I thought it was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. And so like I had like this fuzzy white blanket that I put behind my head and I wrapped like you know, wrapped myself up in another blanket so that I just looked like this floating baby head that was like all wrapped in blankets. And, and so then I experimented with all these different kind of characters, like who is this character? And then 
um, I have a friend who's really good at naming stuff. And I was like, you guys, I want to do this ancient baby wisdom. <laughs> so I was like, I need a name for my baby. And so then my friends were brainstorming all these things. And one of my friends came up with something. And so we ended up, I ended up taking one word he used and another word I was using and came up with baby monk. So baby monk was this character who I would use my own voice, uh, but then I would just say things full of wisdom in my own voice that were actually really serious things. Um, but, but I would do it in this little, it was kind of creepy. And um, that character ended up getting a lot of attention because it was just so, like you couldn't look away. It was like, you know, a car accident when you drive by because it was just so like weird. And <laughs> but I thought it was the funniest thing I'd ever done. And then Baby Monk um, has a puppet in one of them. And <laughs> It's just, it's just ridiculous. Um, but that, those are some of the things that I did um, from a humor standpoint. Uh, and then I did a bunch of, like I did parody videos and you know, sang more songs. Um, I did a parody to the Veggie Tales. Uh, they do this song um, called Where Is My Hairbrush? <laughs> and so I did a parody that was, you know, oh, where is my hair? And my husband was in that one with me. Uh, and one of the things about cancer treatment that I did not know is that you literally lose all of your hair everywhere. And so that was part of the story, like part of the song was like, there's <laughs> now I'm going to laugh because I can't even talk about it. It's so funny. But there's this scene where we have, I, I'm shooting with the camera down and my husband like sticks his head out between my legs because it's like, he's like, no hair anywhere. I'm like, <laughs> nope. <laughs> There's really no hair anywhere. And so, um, so yeah, so we had a lot of fun and I did a parody to a Billie Eilish song and because I have teenagers in my house. And so if we just had a ball and I, and I included my family too. So it wasn't just me. Uh, but I included my family and friends. And so it was just, it was just a blast. So what, um, <laughs> yeah, in the, in the background are all these people, right? That you're, you're engaging with, right? So it's not like you're doing this alone, which I think also seems to be one of the key, yeah. key elements to this, right? And that you're, yes. you build humor um, together in some way, right? You know, yes, absolutely. And that's a huge part of it. You know, when you, if you think about when you go to um, any experience where you sing together mm. and the whole, you know, whether you go to a baseball game or you go to a service or you go to a concert, like if you're singing with other people, it has this really beautiful effect of like putting everybody in resonance and it releases all those beautiful endorphins and oxytocin, you know, all those feel good chemicals. And so, you know, you stand in this moment thinking like, oh my gosh, and suddenly you turn to the person next to you and they're your best friend. And that's what humor does too. The creation of that creative act together, the laughing together, you know, all of that creates such a beautiful sense of community and belonging. That was huge. I, I honestly, you know, I've, I've been a, a, a firstborn independent uh, person for much of my life. And what I found was that when I created the stuff with other people and laughed with other people, I just felt so connected and part of a community that in a way that I really hadn't in a long time. So it was, it was so healing for sure. Beautiful. What, um, you wanna share with us some of your uh, creations? Some of my creations? Yes, I would love to. Well, how about if I play you the intro to the um, show first and then maybe a baby monk? Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to just share my screen. Okay. So here we go with the intro of the comedy show. Did I mention? 
mention, there's also a global financial crisis. So clearly, it's time to laugh. (laughs) Amen to that. I'm your host, Jacqueline Fletcher Johnson. Let's do this. That's uh, that's the intro. That was my friend Rachel, who we had actually a laugh contest, <laughs> and so she has the best laugh of anyone I know. So I ran a little contest on my page for my friends, saying if anybody's got a better laugh, please send it. And so my friends were posting, uh, you know, their favorite laughs, and my friend um, Katie had put a, uh, her son laughing. Oh, and it was just awesome because, of course, the mirror neurons, we know that, right, you hear laughter, you see laughter, you start to laugh yourself, you feel that great. And so I saw these pictures of everybody, they were sending me of people laughing, these videos of people laughing. It was just so fantastic. So it was like this community sourced, you know, again, uh, really medicine (laughs) that Mm. I was taking. Um, And then I will show you baby monk, his baby monk. Um, you can get a get a feel for baby monk. Makes me think about how um, how that's so easy to do, right? And it's so pleasurable. <laughs> why why do we not do this more often? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we get swept up. You know, we get swept up in without consciousness in doing all the things that we think we're supposed to be doing. And I think that that, I mean, that's certainly where I was and not really taking the time. I've, you know, this experience was such a beautiful stripping down of what is really important. And, you know, it, it made, I think this experience for all of us in the last year and a half has been to the gift from all of this, from the coronavirus and everything is that, you know, we get to really look at ourselves and look at our lives and say, is this, is this really what I want? Is this really how I want to live? And is this really who I want to be? Like, we get to ask ourselves those questions in times like these. It's a beautiful, ripe time for that. And it's really the energy of change is here. I mean, it's, it's really that, that time where change, I think, is easier because everything is up in the air it's it's so chaotic uh that times like that when you're really just stripped down it gives us these opportunities so um yeah i i you know the because the other part of this you know humor was a huge part of it but the other part was just pleasure and play and and so i started doing things like going kayaking because I love to go kayaking. I love to hike. I like to be out in the woods and, you know, all of these things that I'd really just not allowed myself time for. Um, And taking vacations, (laughs) you know, like so many people in the United States, I was not taking vacations. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that, you know, I was just reading there, there was some data that came out from the Harvard Business Review and the folks that were behind the the Maslach, burnout inventory. And they just surveyed 1500 people in 46 different countries from a whole variety of industries. And they found that like 89% of us report being, you know, stressed out and burned out. Like, this is a problem for a lot of us. Uh, And so I don't know, I think the things that you and I both teach that they're so important right now, because I think people are more open to hearing and then not only hearing, but doing something about it. Um, Because of course I knew intellectually all of the things that make people resilient. I know it's good sleep. I know it's good nutrition. I know it's, you know, working on controlling mind wandering. Like I know all these things about the science around resilience. What, what I didn't, what I didn't know is that I I also had to live. So, and, and um, yeah, it's so easy to go to a dark place and it's so e- it's interesting how easy it is, right? It, it's easy to go to a dark place and it's easy to, to trivialize within yourself what you actually enjoy. And I, and I found over the years that people are oftentimes 
in, in a really strong state of um, denial. I don't know what the right word is. Denial or simply not allowing themselves to go to those enjoyable places, right? That um, I can remember one client I worked with and she came to the conclusion, you know, she would work hard and as a, as a reward, she would, you know, get a massage on a Friday night or something like that. And, and, um, and then in the middle of that, she had this realization, she goes, oh my God, I'm treating myself like a lab rat. You know, I, I get, I get a little pellet at the end of the week if I'm a good kid, you know? Yes. uh, Oh my gosh. And I think the conclusion that we came to in that conversation was that None of these enjoyable things, these pleasurable things should be part of getting work done, not the reward you get at the end for having done it, right? And then how do you make life itself enjoyable, you know? And it's not something we, I think we, at least a lot of us default to, right? And And it's a very, we're very serious and people are really good at being serious and we're not necessarily, uh, attuned to embracing the wisdom of frivolity you know and and the power of that well and the, i think the power of that is something that i certainly was you know i thought it was to do things that were fun or pleasurable i mean it was a waste of time it was self-serving it was selfish it was weakness like i mean all of those things you know and i've heard people talk about those things too Um, What I discovered, though, was that the minute I started, so, you know, I went through this experience personally, where I had this mega, you know, paradigm shift, which was, I have to make fun and pleasure and lightness and laughter and love my top priority going forward in everything I do. Not just at home, not just when I'm on stage, not just when I'm with a client, like all the time, and that I have to weave it into everything. And that was really the, the biggest thing I walked away from that experience last year with. And, and, and then, so I started to build it into my business because I really took the time to say, you know, I, you know, I was like, oh, I, if I'm not doing something, I'm, I don't have value, I have to achieve, I have to keep going, you know, which I hear from a lot of um, other breast cancer survivors that I've talked to and worked with. They're like, you know, got to get right back to work. And I have to, you know, not just sit here because I won't have value if I'm not doing and contributing. And so I just sat for a while. I said, you know what, A, I have value just because I'm alive. So I'm going to explore that feeling. And if I'm rooted there and I say, if, if I look at my, I looked at my business and said, what if, what do I want to do now with it? Do I want to continue to do the same business I was doing before? Do I want to like, what does that even look like? And how do I weave nourishment into my business so that it is actually a pillar of the business and lightness and fun and pleasure? And so, uh, you know, a lot of organizations have, you know, you have a little list of a checklist that you check off if you're going to do a new project, right? If you're going to take on a new, you know, work with a new partner or whatever it is. And so I really put together this, this decision matrix. And uh, with the things that, you know, the, the new projects would have to meet. And the last one I put on there is that it has to be fun and pleasurable and nourishing. And so then I was working with a business mentor and she said, you know, for, all, for every business, one of the questions has to be the deal breaker. And she said, what if for you, for your business, the question is that last one about nourishment and play and pleasure. And I was like, whoa, wait, what? I mean, that changes everything. Mm. That changes everything. And it changes how I approach my work. It changes how I approach, you know, what I say on stage or what I want to talk about. I mean, it's changed literally everything. And um, and that's where, you know, so many people talk about business then becomes effortless there is effort there, but it feels fun. And so that's where I feel like I understand that the days that I sit at the desk all day and do not get up and stay on Zoom all day 
and work and work and work. And then I bring my meals to my desk and then I work some more and then I sleep a little bit and I get up and work. And then I work when I do that, this is actually, this is the perfect segue to this quote I wanted to read you. The opposite of play is not work. The opposite of play is depression. Our inherent need for variety and challenge can be buried by an overwhelming sense of responsibility. Over the long haul, when these spice of life elements are missing, what is left is a dulled soul. And that was the researcher, Dr. Stuart Brown. He's a play researcher. But I read that and I was like, a dulled soul. That is what I had. That is what I do not want to have ever again. And I don't want anybody listening to this, you know, to have that. And I don't want any of us to have a dulled soul. That's profound that the opposite of play is depression. Yeah. yeah. You know, of the many discoveries of coronavirus, you know, the coronavirus has, uh, or the pandemic situation and all that has come along with it uh, has brought is, you know, as you talk about this reevaluation and like what, what, what from your life are you going to let go of? I think is something that a lot of people are asking and and that the idea that you, uh, what I found, I was doing a, a course yesterday for a group of executives and that people were really clear that work was not their number one priority. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that was that, you know, there were other things that were more important. Yeah. And it would be curious to know how that will kind of reverberate throughout the culture as this, as this um, kind of wears on. But, and, you know, if the opposite of play is depression, and I can think about, you know, being a grad student at the University of Chicago, which is, you know, the, the, the unofficial motto of which is where fun goes to die, and, and being profoundly depressed and thinking about, oh, when you have, if your mind is only oriented around production, then it's really easy to kind of lose yourself in that and lose, you know, if what's the opposite of dullness, you know, you lose that vibrancy of, of being alive, right? And, and that's, that's really profound. And then, and then I like the fact that you took, took it one step further to build in that energy into your work, right? So that it's, it's not play and work are opposites, but rather how does work become an expression of play? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, and sometimes, of course, it's not. But what I've found is that the whole experience, if I am, you know, and this is almost a cliche now, but if I, literally, if I am giving myself the things that I need to feel alive, then the the ways that I um, drove myself or you know, fell into negative patterns of thinking around, I, you know, I must strive, I must do, I must prove, like all of that stuff really falls away when it's really more about what would be fantastic, you know, because work can be fantastic. Work can be really fun. It can be feel really good to be productive. Um, but when, like what you said really gave me chills, like when pr production becomes the end game, then it's just, it strips the life out of it. And so, and I keep, you know, I keep, I think one of the gifts that you and I both have had is that we know that, that life is finite and we know that something terrible can happen at any moment. And so that is terrifying on some level. And I don't want to make light of that. The, uh, but the other side of it is that, you know, for me, I couldn't live there. I could not live in the terror. I did sometimes, but, but I think that, you know, life is inherently terrifying for, for everyone. And we don't like to think about that. And so, you know, really where I think this, where the, that we can go with this is I'm actually circling right back to where we started with the work that you and I do, because, you know, I was, I was in this place where before the cancer happened, 
I ended up doing this gratitude practice because everybody was like, okay, you know, and I teach about gratitude. Like I always have to practice what I preach. You know, I want to make sure I'm doing whatever it is that I'm telling other people to do. And I was like doing, you know, this gratitude practice where I would get my family together around the table and I would, I would like, okay, everybody, we have to go around the table and say one thing we're grateful for what that happened today and blah, blah, blah. And very quickly, you're not going to be surprised to hear, like, we started just doing like to check off our list. We started repeating ourselves. I mean, it just got kind of boring after a while. And so I was like, well, that didn't work. And so then I started to use my journal to do this gratitude practice. And I did it for about seven months before I got the cancer diagnosis. And so every morning I would get up and I would write, you know, three things that I was grateful for from the last 24 hours. And I would, um, you know, sometimes tell a story about that. And then I would remember it and feel the gratitude in my body that I had felt, you know, for that thing that happened. Um, and then I would also write in three things that I wanted more of in my life. And so I was doing these two practices together. So one was, um, you know, this gratitude practice. The other was really empowering. Like um, it was almost like I was programming myself uh, to bring in what I wanted more of. And play and pleasure was one of those things. And it had been on my list for a while as something I, I knew intellectually I wanted more of. Um, but what happened was that I didn't realize I was doing is that I was actually changing my brain, which we know from the mindfulness research all says is possible, right? And I ended up, uh, the, the day that I was diagnosed this Friday the 13th of December of 2019, I spent three days after that writing in my journal in the mornings, freaking out. And I let it all go. The fear, the confusion, the like everything I was feeling was on the page. But then on the, the, the third day, what was really interesting, um, I, I got up and I got my journal and I got my cup of tea like I do every morning. And I, without even thinking about it, I started, I went right back to my gratitudes and right back into things I wanted to, to bring more of into my life. And I had no conscious like I didn't make a conscious decision to do that. I just returned to it. Mm. And so that was a really profound moment too from all of this where I was like, oh my gosh, I've, I've been training my brain to look for things to be grateful for. And then I've been training my brain to also be empowered about things I want more of in my life. And so then I've been giving myself permission to be grateful, to feel good, to have positive emotions, to have the things that I really desire in my life. And so it was this, this really cool kind of permission giving that I didn't realize I was doing uh, that really served me so well through the whole uh, journey with cancer. And I use it now to this day too. I've, I've used it all the way through the cancer experience and I continue to use it. Um, that, that simple practice. Um, but for me, I needed to add that empowering ask of something I wanted more of. Um, and sometimes I would ask for the same thing every day. Uh, and sometimes I would change it up. Uh, but you know, if there was something that was really long term, I would just ask for the same thing over and over again, if, especially if I had no control over it. Um, so yeah. So that's a, I think a perfect entry point to talk about writing and that aspect of your life. And I know in our previous conversations, we've talked about you, you teach writing in a hospital context or medical context to physicians and nurses. And I wondered if you might speak to that some more. Yeah, absolutely. So I really believe that storytelling is the most powerful tool on earth. I, I really believe it is the most. I mean, if you really think about it, we are entirely made out of stories. Our identities are made out of stories, our beliefs. I mean, everything about us is made out of story. And so the work that I do, um, you know, within healthcare and actually outside of it too, but I tend to work a lot with physicians and nurses and, and clinical staff of a variety of kinds, um, but is really this idea of, um, you know, that, that we know that writing is a healing tool. And so I host and co-created a show for Mayo TV 
um, called Healing Words that's really specifically about using writing as a healing tool. Um, and there's this fantastic researcher, uh, someday I hope to meet him. Um, his name is James Pennebaker, um, but he was at the, I believe still is at the University of Texas at Austin. And he did a lot of really elegantly designed studies around what is it, what is it about writing that is so healing? And, and I was also kind of thinking about that myself because I was working with patients at the bedside. I had always taught writers who wanted to be writers. And then I ended up doing this, you know, helping uh, Mayo Clinic start their creative writing at the bedside program in Rochester, Minnesota, working directly one-on-one -on -one with patients. And they were people who didn't want to be writers. They were people who were from all walks of life, who were in a crisis moment in their lives. And it was a really profound uh, learning for me to say, what, what is it? What is it about story? What is it about writing that is so powerful? Um, and there are multiple things about writing, but what I love about it is, A, it can plug us, and this is James Pennebaker, what he found, um, he didn't term it this way, but he, you know, it plugs you into the growth mindset. So it really, when you, when you use writing in a way that is to address what's happened to you, to be honest about the feelings that it brings up in you, and then to also say, and how, what did I learn from this? what deeper knowledge of myself or the world have I gotten because of this experience? That's the part of writing that can be incredibly powerful. I think the other part of writing that is just so critical is that it, con like, it connects us, like we talked about with humor, it connects us to other humans so that we don't feel like we're alone. Uh, and when we tell our stories, um, I heard Kevin Kling, who's one of Minnesota's famous and most wonderful storytellers, I saw him speak uh, about a year ago, and one of the things that he said was, you know, the ancient Greeks had the same word for, um, they would, or they would pray out loud because they believed that um, the same word for breath was the same word they had for spirit. And so they that's why they prayed out loud because they believed that expressing yourself uh, expressed your spirit, your soul, your humanity. Uh, and so I think about that a lot with writing, that it's not only the act of, you know, finding a beautiful way to tell a gorgeous story or write a poem, but it is the act of expressing your soul. It is the act of expressing who you are in the world and, um, and to clarify an experience and understand it that I think is so healing. And I have seen it help people. Oh, I, I mean, this is where I just feel so humbled you know, I've seen it help, uh, you know, there was a woman who lost her husband uh, in April uh, that he died suddenly in her arms. Mm. I've seen it help uh, people who were going through the, um, uh, th there was a shooting here in Minnesota in a hospital, in, a, in a, a clinic. I've seen it help, you know, frontline workers in the, in, the, in the pandemic. I've seen it work folks who've been through some kind of childhood trauma. I've seen it work for people who are just, you know, parents and really busy and kind of stressed out at work. Uh, and so I, that's the other thing I love about it is it works for everyone, um, regardless of if you think you're a writer or not. Uh, it's really the act of expression that's so powerful. It's not like uh, clinical or, you know, therapy, right? There's something very, you know, to kind of think about the original meaning of the humanities. Right. And, right. and the ex and the expression of that. Right. It's beautiful. That's right. I mean, it is artists have been always the stewards of our emotional world. Mm -hmm. And we are all artists. We are all creatives. We all have a creative part of us. And so I think that that is, you know, to your point, it's not therapy, but it is humanity. I mean, that this is where our humanity lies. And it's, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm down on therapists, but it uh, doesn't pathologize human experience, right, in, in that way. It's just dealing with human experience as opposed to taking on a mantle of there's something wrong with me. And then how do I get fixed? It's it's embracing, you know, that human experience can be painful sometimes. And here's a tool to help navigate that. 
Exactly. Exactly. I mean, human experience is human experience and it is hard sometimes. And that's just the way it is. That's just life. Mm -hmm. And so I just keep thinking about that. And story is how we have helped each other from the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember I went on a hike um, out in Vegas. There's the, I can't remember the name of it. It's the Red Rock National Park, maybe. Is that what it is? Yep. And uh, we went hiking there and there's this amazing expanse on one of the rocks of all of the, this art that, you know, ancient humans had um, put on these rocks. And there was one where it was somebody's handprint. And oh. I remember just, I burst into tears because I was like, we, here it is. This is expression right here. I mean, this is how we have been humans from the beginning. And so to share ourselves with each other through story, to share ourselves with ourselves through story uh, is really how we're human. How, what would be, uh, for somebody listening to this or watching this, what would be a prompt you might suggest to them? Like how, mm. how could they do this on their own? Or at least a writing like, prompt? Yeah, or like what would you, Mm -hmm. hmm. You know, there's two things coming. I mean, so first I would say uh, a writing exercise to actually answer this question about what nourishes me. And to answer that question, you know, so what nourishes me? And I say, and I would write an answer to that question 25 times, 50 times, and just over and over and over again. I would, I would, I would offer that as a prompt. Then for a straight up writing prompt, I would offer uh, your listeners this one that I just absolutely love because, you know, mindfulness came so easily to me because I have training as an artist. Mm -hmm. And so what I always teach in any course I do is deep observation, deep artistic observation is the same in my mind as mindfulness observation. And so I would say if you find something to observe, so whether that's something outside or an object, you know, in your home or another human or something, but to find something to observe closely and to look for all the sensory details of that thing. So the, the smell, the taste, the touch, the textures, uh, the sound, whatever those sensory details are, and to write about that write it down, write down what you notice, what you observe, and then write down what does it make you feel? And to start to explore the feeling part of, of that, because then that helps you kind of identify, because there's some of us that have a hard time identifying our feelings. It helps you start to identify feelings. Do I feel good? Does it make me feel nothing? Does it make me feel bad? Does it make, you know, what does it make me feel? So I guess I would start there is to observe something and then write about it. A paragraph, maybe two paragraphs. Yeah. I, I, that's wonderful. I, it reminds me of a story of one of the one of the French impressionists, and I can't remember who, but he had a friend who was also a French impressionist and, and he was depressed and, and he said, you know, what should I do? And the, and the fellow told him, go watch the animals at the zoo. Oh, and, love it. Uh, that's, what, a, what an interesting idea, right? To kind of, A, put your attention outside yourself and, but also to engage with other living creatures, right? And, uh, you know, that's really interesting because I know it's been said in some of the research uh, around, you know, positive emotions and mindfulness that this work leads, to, but, you know, I hadn't read that until when I experienced this this work leads to awe mm. and that feeling of awe and connectedness to the world around us is so healing. And I remember one of the experiences that I had was, um, it was actually pre-cancer. Um, I was having some heart issues because I was so stressed out and I was getting heart palpitations and insomnia. And it was all, you know, I went into the doctor and she diagnosed me like within seconds and she's like, uh, you're stressed. 
And I was like, I am not stressed. Like I teach this stuff for a living. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and she's like, well, you're breathing way up here, you know, and your collarbones is like, you are stressed. And so I didn't, um, I didn't really listen to her, to be honest. Uh, and then I had kind of a scary episode on a treadmill where my heart just felt like it was flipping around in my chest. And so I went through all of the heart tests and one of the experiences that I had in that moment was that they, you know, they took this picture of my eye where I could see all of the veins of my eye on the screen. And I was like, oh my gosh, it looks just like a leaf. It looks like a tree, like all of these branches of the veins in my eye. And, you know, and then I saw pictures of my heart and I'm like, oh my gosh, that also looks like the pattern of the tree and the leaf. And I just had this massive feeling of awe and feeling so overwhelmed by the beauty of, of nature, of humans, of the life that we have. Um, and that feeling is just the most healing feeling on earth. Um, so I think that that's, you know, when people ask me like, why should I do this stuff? And how fast am I gonna feel good? And, you know, it's, it's a lifelong practice but it leads to these moments of just transcendence where you feel like everything is worth it. I can remember in the days before my transplant surgery, I'd have to drive 45 minutes to the dialysis clinic. And, um, and which meant I had to get up at like 4.30 in the morning and, and before oh. the traffic on the streets of Los Angeles and, and get to this place uh, to get hooked up to the machine. And one of the practices I gave myself was to look at what's beautiful. Oh. And it was not quite sunrise. It wasn't quite night, you know, and, and, um, and then the kind of relentlessly doing this in, in, um, and I was not in good shape. Frankly, I shouldn't have been in the car, let alone driving 45 minutes across town. But I can remember there was this one, there was one moment where, you know, I must have hit a tipping point. And on the particular road I was on, which is a two freeway, and which is like the one of the few freeways, freeways in Los Angeles that doesn't get congested. But it also has a really brilliant view of downtown Los Angeles. And I saw this view and I just noticed, oh, it's really beautiful. And, and it must have been like the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back. And I felt this really intense physical shift in my brain, like something new, like a new room opened up. Uh. Like the river, it was more like the river changed course. And, and I felt big. And there was no fear in that space. And, and I thought, and that was just by paying attention to what was beautiful, right? And- Oh my and, gosh, you just gave me so many chills when you said that there was no fear in this space. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it wasn't like I had gone off to the mountaintop for six months to sit in a cave somewhere. It was driving to the dialysis clinic yeah, and looking for looking for beauty, and and I think you know as we go through this pandemic and all the other stuff that has come along with it, looking for beauty, attuning yourself to that, no matter what's going on, uh, can be a source of what you talked about earlier in terms of nourishment, right? And oh, yeah. and like how do we use our attention in a way that serves us rather than is debilitating. Mm. You know, that's so right. And I think it's something that we don't have to be going through something hard, you know, cause I keep thinking about that too. I mean, you and I have some heavy stories. <laughs> <laughs> we have heavy stories and it, it and, and it, this can work for anyone and it doesn't matter how heavy your story is. You know, I, I, I had this experience with my daughter and she has just turned 13. And so last summer we were doing all of these hikes and we ended up going to the Boundary Waters, which, um, so we took my daughter to the Boundary Waters, uh, which is between Minnesota and Canada. And it's this massive 
um, nature reserve, basically. And it's all these lakes are up there. I mean, it's just the most beautiful uh, place you'd ever see and you can't develop it at all. And so there's this, I took her to this uh, resort that was right on the edge and it was in September. So it was off season and there was hardly anyone there. And it was about 11 o'clock at night. And I was like, come on, you've got to come with me. We got to go outside. And so I made her bundle all up. It was, you know, unseasonably cold in Minnesota. And we um, got flashlights and I was like, I'm not, she's like, what are we doing? I'm, like, I'm not telling you, come on. And, you know, my husband came along and so we bundled up and we went outside and I brought her down to the beach of this lake. And I said, okay, now lie down on the sand. And, you know, and I had had her keep her eyes closed so that she, you know, didn't know what we were doing. And we lay in the sand and we, so we were on the edge of this lake and there's this, these amazing trees all the way around with all these um, pine trees and this bowl of sky and the Milky Way was right above us. Like you could almost just reach out and touch it. And so I was like, okay, open your eyes. And she looked up and she saw this and, you know, she was just, she's, you know, she was 12 at the time. And she said, mom, yeah, after a while, first we were just silent for a while. But after a while, she said, mom, you know, all those things that I worry about? I'm like, yeah. She said, they're just, none of them really matter. I said, nope, none of them really matter. And she was 12, you know, and she brought that feeling home with her and she was able to not only experience it again, but then remember it. And every time she remembered it, she was able to kind of plug back into that feeling. And so now she has this tool, this visual in her mind that she can return to, you know, when she's feeling out of sorts. So. Massive shift in perspective, right? Which I guess is what this whole conversation has been about. It's about how do you shift yeah. perspective, and whether it's humor or beauty or what you find nourishing, and um, and how do you make it? It's not an it's not a extra, right? It's not a nice to have. I, I I really I really come to as much as I thought I understood that before, but something about you know our recent experience really kind of hammered it home in a new way that it's it's not it's not a it's not an extra it's not a luxury right it's part of what makes a good life is having and cultivating intentionally this relationship with you know what what do you want to call it goodness some something you know that's that's not fashionable but um but you know what is it that is uh, real to you, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and I love that phrase that you said that this is how we have a good life. This is it right here, yeah. That they exist um, simultaneously, you know, that a good life is not one that is absent of pain and suffering, but in the midst of pain and suffering, you also have this. And I think that is really important to know. I think that's really, really important to think about that it's, it's, it's all happening all at the same time. And we can have, we have space within us to hold it all. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that to also hold that joy, you know, because I find sometimes people short circuit that part a lot and, you know, start to feel joy and then shut it down in some way. And so I think just like, you know, just like these, these pair, you know, these perspective shifts help when you're feeling, you know, something hard or going through something hard, they also help us really be in the moments where it's wonderful. Um, and that's the part too, I think that I really, really value now is to just really know, wait, to wake up in those moments to be like, this is awesome. Like right now, this is awesome. Right. Yeah, it's realizing this is awesome, the moment that it's happening, not six yeah. weeks later, like, oh, that was awesome, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. Like, right now, this is awesome, and I love my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is a perfect place to put a bookmark for what is surely another conversation that we will come back to, but thank you so much for taking time uh, to share this and your experience. Oh, thank you. It's just a delight to talk with you. I always have so much fun. Thank you. Thank <laughs> yeah, you. Likewise. Great. 
Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to the podcast. Give us a review and tell us your thoughts. The best thing you can do is share this with someone who would find it interesting and helpful. If you have an idea for other topics you'd like to explore, please let us know. Contact me at info at jeremyhunter.net. Thank you to the multi-talented Mr. Jason Beck for making the magic happen behind the scenes. And our music is the creation of Jeffrey with a G Munger. You can learn more about his work at kettleblackmusic.com.